Hey, hey, everybody, it's Eddie from Tokyo. This is your cryptocurrency update from Japan. And I apologize if I worried anybody with my tweet last night about the earthquake that occurred in Tokyo. Well, it actually happened off the coast of Fukushima, which is really unsettling. It was an aftershock from the March 11, 2011 earthquake that was a 9.0. Zero. This was a 7.1 in magnitude. And in terms of a Shindo scale, which is what is used in Japan to, to uh, explain how much of the shake you feel, it was a Shindo 4 compared to a Shindo 5 that was in 2011 for Tokyo. Let me tell you, Shindo 4 gets your attention. And luckily, nobody lost their life. There was about a million people who lost their power. There was a huge slide and, of course, major train delays. But uh, Mother Nature has a really violent force. And here is Hime, who captured that on her cell phone. It is really uh, quite scary. It's something you just don't get used to, especially the big ones. Okay, we're going to talk about regulation. And even if you're not interested in the Ripple versus or the SEC versus Ripple complaint, I think if you're in the cryptocurrency space, you really need to pay attention to what is happening with the SEC. We have a new chairperson coming in. It looks like it's going to be Gary Gensler. He is going to be up for nomination. And because there is so much going on, like for example, example Tesla is adding BTC to their treasury. We have BNY Mellon, which is America's oldest bank, announcing that they are going to get into crypto custody. We have MasterCard that is now setting up more merchants to accept crypto payments you can bet the sec is going to be very busy this year and reuters published an article on uh hester person included a couple of quotes that are really interesting she wants clear cryptocurrency regulatory regime and feels it has <laughs> it's urgently needed yeah, I think everyone would agree with her. What is so amazing is that this space with uh, cryptocurrency becoming part of the mainstream is becoming very normal so fast. And when she was asked about the pump scheme that came from the Reddit rally in the GameStop Corporation, she said that it was wonderful to have new generations of investors able to participate. So unique perspective and it's totally different from what we are hearing from the acting sec chair allison heron lee she was asked about the wall street boys in this podcast with npr completely different point of view have a listen to fi you know I have to ask you, the SEC was formed at the height of the Great Depression to protect investors, but obviously a lot has changed since the 1930s. How well do you think SEC rules reflect this new reality we live in today with social media and, and trading apps like Robinhood? Well, you know, the more things change, the more they stay the same, Elsa. <laughs> um, I will say that I have watched the tried and true principles upon which the SEC is founded. I have watched them work well for decades. Um, we adapt. We understand how to adapt. We have an extremely expert staff um, who has seen decades of, of different types of misconduct taking different forms, but they fit into some pretty predictable buckets. So, um, you know, I think we have the tools and we are, we are using them. And so she sees it as misconduct. She thinks she has the tools and they're using them. So it, it is really a heavy hand. And when you take a look at the public statement that she put out on the 11th, we are so lucky to have Jeremy Hogan from Legal Briefs covering this step by step, because as he gives us insight in his video, there has been a 180 degree turn and an about face. And I think that the fact that it's going to be now much more difficult to reach a settlement without this waiver that she has totally removed from being part of the default, 
uh, was aimed at giving Ripple a bad time. I really do think that is what is happening here. Please listen to Jeremy in his part one and part two video. I'm going to play a little bit of his part two video, but he's really doing a fabulous job, uh, especially when you learn that what was taken out by Miss Lee was actually used in the kick case, but now it can't be used. When we listen to one of her keynote speeches in, uh, from April 2020, you're going to see, I think, very clearly why Mr. Garlinghouse and Mr. Larson are included in the complaint along with the company because she thinks that the best way to get com compliance is through deterrence. And to get deterrence, which is a way to create doubt and fear, to discourage any kind of action or behavior, is to go after people personally. So she's talking about personal liability. Have a listen. Goal at all times of enforcement is compliance. That's what we want. We just want compliance. And so, you know, what's the best way once it comes to the enforcement division? Um, you know, it's, it, there's already been potentially um, a lack of compliance. So deterrence, deterrence is how you achieve compliance. How do you achieve deterrence? In my view, personal liability. Now, that has to be in the right case. There has to be, but it's, you know, to, to have a series of, you know, over a, over a series of time, kind of a, a drift toward only corporate accountability. Corporations are people. There are people in those corporations that are doing this. I think that we should be always carefully looking to see when there are individuals um, who, who may be responsible for some of the violations. I think that is a strong, strong deterrence. But as always, we must be fair and thoughtful. <laughs> we must be fair and thoughtful, but let's go after them personally, because after all, companies are people. Yeah, I'm not surprised now at all that they've been thrown into the mix. So when is Gary Gensler coming? He is going to take that SEC chair once he gets nominated. And according to today's Bloomberg, he has provided the first step. And that is by disclosing to the Office of Government Ethics his net worth. It looks as though in the breakdown, he is worth as much as 119 million, and that does include the 100,000 in capital gains from his Tesla shares. So the confirmation could take weeks or months, according to the Bloomberg article. I think, however, with the drama that is occurring within the SEC, I do believe this is going to get bumped up to a priority. Here, the day after Ms. Lee put in that change to take out that waiver, well, we have a complete public disagreement of that move made by Hester Peirce and Elad Roisman. The public statements that um, they have put really show that uh, they don't agree with her abrupt change at all. And this is where, when you listen to Jeremy's videos, you're going to really understand this because of the great coverage that he is doing. Now, this is his part two of what I found so interesting towards the end of his video, where he now has a change in the timeline of how long this might take. Have a listen here. But once he is confirmed, this decision will be squarely in his lap. And although Gensler is not a deregulationist by any stretch of the imagination, he is a crypto guy and he is not going to want to see Ripple leave to Japan. Now, this is just my opinion. And it's as good as yours, but I believe that Gensler will approve the settlement that I believe Ripple offered as the SEC. So what I am seeing in these statements is kind of a public airing of grievances of an issue central to the behind the scenes negotiations that I think are going on with Ripple and the SEC currently. A settlement that would be good enough for Ripple 
and great for us as owners of XRP. As you may recall, my previous thought was that the Ripple case was likely to settle towards the end of the year, maybe in October or November at mediation, and I now have a new opinion. I would suggest that we see a settlement either before the 22nd, which is the pretrial conference, or shortly after Gensler's confirmation. I no longer believe the most likely outcome here is that this case goes to the end of the year. The main reason I sense this is not because I trust in Gensler so much as because I sense that Ripple is conceding more than I had previously imagined. And therefore, I feel that the sides have come so much closer to an agreement than I imagined would be possible for before really on Ripple's behalf. So everyone keep your eyes down, your ears open. I sense that something is in the air, my friends. So he senses something is different and in the air and... Yeah, it, it, he also believes that we could maybe possibly see something uh, close to the call that's going to take place on February 22nd. This is the council for all parties that are directed to appear uh, telephonically for an initial pretrial conference, and it is scheduled for that 10 a.m. on February 22nd. Well, I just don't know, you know, but I do appreciate hearing the opinions from Jeremy. I think the way he is thinking it through just helps us all uh, get through a lot of the um, the fog. Yeah. So, Mr. Gensler, I think he's going to fly through the nomination with no snags. Here is the financial services press release by the ranking Republican Patrick McHenry, and he is speaking through a statement. And it's very encouraging because as a Republican, he's talking very positive about the Democrat uh, choice. It's Gary's acceptance of the financial technology and cryptocurrency is a welcome change from many Democrats who avoid innovation just because they don't understand it. And I will continue and encourage the SEC to provide regulatory clarity to enhance collaboration, to keep pace with the evolving nature of digital assets. And if Mr. Gensler is confirmed by the Senate, I am willing to work with him towards that end. And that was a really positive statement that came. And when we take a look at the Banking, Housing and Urban's Affair website, we can see the up and coming hearings on their calendar. And there's only two scheduled for February thus far. February 18th, there is an equitable recovery meeting. And then there is on February 23rd, a monetary policy report to Congress. So I think this is the website that we can um, follow to see when that confirmation is going to take place. All right, everybody. Yeah, I am jumping to some fluff. And today is Valentine's Day in Japan. And believe it or not, this giddy, giddy choco, which is, which is what it's called, obligatory, obligatory chocolate day is actually the day that women give chocolate to men. <laughs> it's completely different. The chocolate that is given to women takes place on March 14th. It's called White Day, and they're a little bit mixed up, but that's the way it is here. And what's so funny is that most of that chocolate is done by way of baking at home. That is a big popular thing for young women to do is they'll make the chocolate cookies for everyone uh, uh, in the office basically it's kind of um it, it's a it's a gift that the women in companies give to the men in offices that's and and schools the the school kids do it too um if you go to twitter you can find a lot of examples of those home baked cookies and chocolates that people are making now kit kat of course <laughs> of course didn't uh, snooze on this holiday. They have created something unique, which is the Kit Kat Sushi Sweets. <laughs> I don't know what to say. Oh, it's pretty funny. But if you look at all of the chocolates this year that were ranked by popularity, this is the number one Feliz Biscuit chocolate that sold on Amazon. And I've never tasted this, but this is the number one choice this year and they looked at some 50 different brands of chocolate 
I thought this box was rather expensive. It's it's like over thirty dollars for these chocolate biscuits. I thought that's kind of expensive. Yeah, maybe I would be one if I was giving out chocolate. I'd be baking it at home instead of buying it on Amazon. I don't know. I hope that they're good. And in fact, they've done even studies, and they said that like eighty percent of the men who receive the chocolate never even eat it. <laughs> so, oh my gosh, what a waste of money. All right, everybody, just do take care. Sayonara for now. Bye-bye.